Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here. Good to see you all. Uh, we're going to be looking this morning at what we call the ordinances. In other words, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some of you might be with the, familiar with the term a city ordinance. So what is an ordinance when we talk about a church and a church ordinance? It's not really a term that we use that frequently, but it's something that God wants us to do as a church and as individual members in a church, something that he's commanded us to do. And uh, most of you are familiar with these two topics, at least I hope you are. I'm sure you are. But sometimes uh, the uh, reorganization of old truth can, can bring perhaps uh, some new insights. And uh, I trust the Lord will bless us, even if I'm repeating things that you know all very well, that the Lord will bless his word to your hearts. Let's just open our time in prayer. Our blessed God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we can come here together. We're especially grateful for your presence with us, that um, when we're gathered in your name, in fact, you are here with us and you want to teach each and every one of us from your word by your Holy Spirit. And that's the most important thing. And for some reason, you've chosen men to teach and we're just uh, broken vessels in your hands. But most importantly, we want to hear your voice speaking to our hearts. So speak to our hearts as we open up your word and read it and think on it. Guide us and bless us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, <clears throat> baptism pictures our union with Christ. The Lord's Supper pictures our communion with Christ. Our union with Christ is settled once and for all when we come to him and he baptizes us into his body. However, our communion with him stands in constant danger of interruption. So this is why baptism is once and for all. And uh, the Lord's Supper is a continual observance. So union, baptism, communion, Lord's Supper. So here's the text. We're going to look at baptism first, and then we'll... In the second part of our meeting, look at the Lord's Supper. So here's the text from our website. Uh, and I encourage you to go onto our website if you've never been there. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But uh, there's a lot of interesting things there. And in case I forget, there's also a very good paper on the Lord's Supper on our website. Um, <clears throat> that's right on the front page when you see the, the schedule of events, the Lord's Supper. You click on it, and a paper on the Lord's Supper will come up. I encourage you to read that. But here's what we have for baptism. Baptism by immersion is an expression of a person's identification with Christ and signifies that the one being baptized has been crucified with Christ unto sin, has been buried with him, and is risen with him to walk in newness of life. Baptism is not uh, as a means of nor an aid to salvation, nor as a prerequisite to fellowship at the Lord's Supper. It is, however, expected of all believers in obedience to our Lord and is administered on confession of the person's faith in the Lord Jesus. So there are, in fact, two aspects to, to baptism. There's the inward one and the outward one. There's one that the, where the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ and into his body. That's something that God does. And water baptism is an outward reflection of that. It's what we do. And so the two go together. And I invite you to look at... Okay. It's on. Right? I'm pressing the downward button. Press it again. Press it again. Press it again. Well, there you go. No, it never works for me, this thing. There we go. Whoops. Baptism. Great. Okay, Romans chapter 6. We'll read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. Reading from the New King James Version. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? 
Or do you not know that as many of us as were buried, no, as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's our new life in Christ. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, has been, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to God. To sin. Baptism, water baptism is a wonderful picture of our salvation in Christ. You see, the gospel is not making a good life better. The gospel is not a self-improvement program. The gospel says that even though we're made in the image of God, we've been corrupted by sin. And... <clears throat> There's no way to repair the old man. He has to die. And when we come to Christ, we recognize that we can't save ourselves. There's no amount of good works. There's no amount of, of things that we can do or perform to have salvation. And so the gospel is recognizing that and letting the old man, the old person, die and receiving new life in Christ. So the gospel is not about changing our heart. The gospel is about giving us a new heart, new life in Christ. So baptism is, is a picture of that. The old man, the old self, dead, and we have new life in Christ. He's dead and he's buried, and he's risen again in Christ. So isn't, isn't that a wonderful truth? I hope everyone here today has experienced that truth, new life in Christ. It's not a self-reformation program. It's nothing we can earn or do on our own. And this, <clears throat> this is what most people think. They think that if you do enough good, you do a little more good than bad, the good Lord's going to take you into heaven. Well, that's not the gospel, right? The gospel says that there's nothing we can do. We're, we're corrupt. And we need a totally new package. It's not getting a heart operation. It's not getting your tubes cleaned out or the electricity working better. It's a heart transplant. Right? It's a new life in Christ. Praise God. I trust everybody here has, that, has had that experience, and that is between you and God. Only God can do that. So what is water baptism? Believer's baptism. It's an outward act where we, we testify to that. We say, yeah, I tried, but I couldn't. I'm leaving it behind, and I'm accepting new life in Christ, and I have Christ in me. And I want to demonstrate that. And water baptism is a picture of the death, the burial of the old person, and they're being raised again in Christ. So here. Yep. Just a minute. Okay, let me read this to you. These are spelled out in a number of sentences. We'll just go through it again more slowly. As guilty sinners, we are under the sentence of death. Our old nature was hopelessly evil. God did not choose to improve it or reform it, but rather he ruled that we as evil sons of Adam must die. If we had died literally, we would have perished forever. God sent his son, our, sa our savior, to die as our representative. And as Christ was baptized into death, so everyone who believes on him is baptized into death. In Romans 6, we read, as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried with him through baptism into death. We have been united together in the likeness of his death. Our old man was crucified with him. Our sinful selves are put out of sight. When we come into the good of his death, Christ's death, the moment we are saved. <clears throat> 
We come into the good of Christ's death the moment we are saved. Then we, when we are baptized in water, we announce publicly that when he died, we died. So baptism, water baptism, speaks of our identification with Christ in his death and marks the beginning of a new life, his life lived out in us. So spiritual baptism, if we think of baptism in two parts, the, the, the part done by the Holy Spirit and the part done we do through water, <clears throat> the baptism by the Holy Spirit, the key verse is in... Uh, Romans 6, 3, we just read it, and in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. So notice that the all have been baptized by the spirit. All believers have received the baptism, synonymous with salvation. It's not a special experience for only a few. Um... <clears throat> The following facts are necessary to help solidify our understanding of, of the spirit baptism. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it clearly states that we have all been baptized just as all have been given the spirit to drink, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Second, nowhere in scripture are believers told to be baptized with, in, or by the spirit, or in any sense to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This indicates that all believers have had this experience. So, <clears throat> That's the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts. Then we look at baptism, water baptism. I want us to look at a few passages in the, uh, in the book of Acts. It's quite interesting because there are some different sequences as we look at the four different communities in the book of Acts when they came to know the Lord. You may have noticed this if you've studied this at all. Uh, they are, there are marked differences in the significance and the results of baptism depending on the national status of the people involved. We know that the book of Acts was a book of transitions. So we're going to look at four different communities of believers in the book of Acts and the order of events in connection with conversion and baptism. They're all, they're all different in these cases. First of all, the Jews. The Jews were told to repent, told to be baptized, and after that, they received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, they received the word of God. They were baptized. And the apostles Peter and John laid hands on them. And then they received the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, they all heard the word of God. They believed. They received the Holy Spirit. And then they were baptized. And then John's disciples in Acts chapter 19, they heard Paul's message concerning Christ. They accepted it. They were baptized. Paul laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> why the differences? Well, think about it. Back then, I'm sure a lot of us know that the Jews were, um, the Jewish nation had put to death the Lord Jesus. So by baptism, the Jewish Christian believers were disassociating themselves from the Jewish nation. They were publicly professing their separation from the people who had killed the Lord of life and glory. The Samaritans, they, were, they didn't get along with the Jews, period. And so when they were baptized, it was a public confession of their connection to Christ, the Jewish Messiah. And then the Gentiles, they received the Holy Spirit when they believed, and then they were baptized. John's disciples, like those at Pentecost, these were Jewish believers who were baptized before receiving the Holy Spirit. So the pattern that applies to us today is the pattern that we saw with the Gentiles. We believe, we receive the Holy Spirit, and then we request water baptism. So... <clears throat> The church has a responsibility to baptize. We read in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
So it's the role of the church to baptize, that is, immersing, professing believers into water, taking them out, and it's the role of the Holy Spirit to baptize believers into his body and into Jesus Christ. There are other examples of baptism in the New Testament. We're not going to go into it, but there was John's baptisms, the Jesus disciples baptized people. Uh, there were different sorts of baptisms, but then this Christian baptism is what, we, what we're interested in and what we just saw. Let's look at some more examples. We see in Acts chapter 8, you're probably familiar, most of you are familiar with the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip came alongside, he came to know the Lord. And he said, what's, what, what, what's stopping me from being baptized? So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, verse 18, it says, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose, and he was baptized. Uh, and then there's at Philippi, Lydia, in Acts chapter 16, verse 15, it says, And she and her household were baptized. That's after she had received the Lord. And the Philippian jailer, he took the same hour at that night, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. So it's quite interesting when we look into the Word of God, we see that water baptism is a picture of an inward reality, new life in Christ. Water baptism doesn't give us this new reality. Only God can give us new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit places us in Christ and in the body of Christ. It's interesting to note that in the book of Acts, all new believers were baptized right away in water. And the only examples we have is of people who received the Lord, who consciously accepted the Lord and want to follow him. So we're not talking about infants. So baptism is a tremendous confession of faith, a tremendous word picture. And if you don't know the reality of Christ living in you, then there's no point in getting baptized until you, until you have that straightened out. There are over 150 passages in the New Testament that the, underline the, that the condition for salvation is faith alone. So we're not saved by baptism, nor are we saved by taking... Uh, Communion. So, we've gone over it quickly, but that's, that's baptism. Uh, let's now look at the Lord's Supper. There we go. Change gears. <laughs> so, baptism, union, communion, inward, outward, by the Spirit, in water. We're saved, and we, it only happens once. The Lord's Supper, on the other hand, and here's what we have on our website. The Lord's Supper was commemorated by the early churches on the first day of the week, and we believe it's the privilege and duty of every believer to heed the Lord's command, this do in remembrance of me. So we have a number of biblical texts, in particular Matthew 26, 26 to 30, that we're going to look at. Passages in Mark and in Luke are parallel passages. We have 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 21 that we're going to look at. And 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 to 34 that we're going to look at. So, we practice the Lord's Supper here in a, in a certain way. And um, the Word of God doesn't say a whole lot as to how we're to do it. We'll, we'll look at that. But I've noticed oh, over the years that I've been coming here, some people find our Lord's Supper boring. And over the years, I've heard lots of suggestions as to how we can make it a little more interesting. And uh, I'm going to give you three suggestions in the course of this message as to how we can make it more interesting. So listen up. But our first text will be in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to look at some of these key passages that introduce us to the Lord's Supper. In Matthew 26, reading from verses 26 to 30. Matthew 26, 26 to 30. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. There we go. 
blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for, many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So it's interesting that the Lord's Supper was instituted at the Last Supper, which was the Passover. The Lord instituted the Supper on the night he met with the disciples to keep the annual Passover. And this Passover commemorated the deliverance of Israel from Egypt with the blood of the Passover lamb sprinkled on the doorpost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we read, Paul writes, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. The act of eating the Passover lamb in Israel's feast had its counterpart in the symbolic eating of Christ's body at the supper. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken fruit for you, given for you. We read in 1 Corinthians 11. Now let's think about that. The Lord was physically present when he took in his hand a piece of bread and he said, this is my body. He did not say, this has or will become my body. He said, this is my body. So how could something that he held in his hand be a part of his body? How could the contents of the cup be literally his blood when he had not yet shed it, right? We know that there are people who think that. I have here a picture of my daughter Miriam when she was two and a half. If you want to see it later, you're welcome. If I showed you, if we were talking and I said, this is Miriam, you wouldn't... Uh, think I'd have to say, well, this is a picture of Miriam. I would just say, this is Miriam, right? So <clears throat> when we take the bread, we realize it's just a representation. We don't imagine that the photo itself has become Miriam, and Miriam is like right here living with us, right? And we don't focus our attention on the contents of the frame, right? It, it just represents Miriam. It's only a picture. So <clears throat> when we take the bread and the wine, we remember the Lord. It's just a symbol. There's nothing more to it than that. But it's a very important symbol. Let's read then in um, John chapter 6. We looked at it a little bit this morning already. John chapter 6, verses 53 to 58. <clears throat> uh, Sometimes this passage is, let me get it here, John chapter 6. Verses, uh, starting at verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your father, uh, fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever." <clears throat> Sometimes people have thought of, thought of this passage as a reference to the Lord's Supper, and thus it becomes necessary to take the bread and the wine to obtain eternal life. But this cannot be true. We know that we have eternal life through faith in Christ. But the Lord was explaining that he was the living bread sent down from heaven, a figurative meaning. Just as in chapter 7, he explained the living water to be the Holy Spirit. Israel's Messiah would not command something that was forbidden by Israel's law, that is, eating blood. So eating and drinking is the equivalent of coming to Christ and believing in him. 
The, I think most of us would probably know that the Roman Catholic Church teaches the doctrine of transubstantiation, which means that when Jesus said, this is my body, his words were to be taken literally. That is, when the bread and the wine were blessed, they actually become the body of Christ. Martin Luther rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation and replaced it with the doctrine of consubstantiation. While the elements didn't change, Christ was mysteriously in them. Ulrich Swingley of Zurich, Switzerland, an equally zealous reformer, taught the simplicity of regarding the bread and wine as symbols. So, the bread and the wine are symbols. They're not types. It's the idea that they communicate that is important and not every aspect of their makeup. For example, the Lord used unleavened bread because that is what was used in the Passover. Some suggest we should use unleavened bread for the Lord's Supper. However, the bread is not a type. The bread is a symbol. A type bears resemblance to that which it foreshadows. Likeness is not implied in a symbol. We're not to look for a physical resemblance in such statements as, I am the door, I am the true vine. It's the use of the door. And the vital principle of the vine that are to be noted. So in contrast with the details of the Old Testament ritual, there is a total absence of such in the New Testament in regard to the ordinances. What is important is that it's bread and we remember the Lord's death. The type of bread doesn't matter. Grape juice rather than wine. You may notice that since the, or during the pandemic, we actually switched to fruit of the vine, grape juice, rather than uh, fermented grape juice, wine. And um, if you were to Google grape juice or wine for communion, you'd have a very interesting read. <laughs> Uh, I, I did it recently. It's, it's interesting. And here's something I learned. I, don't, I haven't had the time to check it out, but I think it's probably true. In 1869, an American Methodist minister developed what he called unfermented wine. He did so by applying Louis Pasteur's pasteurization process to grape juice, stopping the natural fermentation process of the grapes, and thereby preventing the juice from turning into wine. This minister's name was Thomas Bramwell Welch, and his innovative beverage became what we know today as Welch's grape juice. Uh, Dr. Welch's development of easily pasteurized grape juice, along with a prohibition era culture, cultural disdain for alcohol, the American church slowly shifted in its thinking on communion wine. And although sacramental wine was explicitly permitted by prohibition law, Methodists and Baptist churches, among others, opted to use Welch's grape juice instead. And seemingly overnight, juice became the preferred substitute for wine among America's evangelical churches. Anyways, it's, it's the meaning of the grape juice that is important to us and not so much the consistency of it, I suggest. Names of the, of the Supper, the Lord's Supper. There are several different names that are used for the Lord's Supper. We have the Lord's Supper. This name draws attention to the authority of the one who invites us to come. It's also an indication of the time of day it was observed. It begun on the night the Lord was betrayed and was linked to the Passover. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, they met in the evening. It's also called a supper in 1 Corinthians. And we can ask ourselves, well, why do we have a supper at 9.30 in the morning? Uh, probably a good question, an honest question. But the Lord didn't command us to have a supper, per se, or a meal, but he did command us to take the bread and the wine. That's my answer to that question. So Christians down through the ages have kept the ordinance of taking the bread and the wine at different times of the day. Some people refer to it as a sacrament. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are sometimes called sacraments. The sacramentum was the Roman soldier's oath of allegiance upon joining the army. The term was considered acceptable by a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The Eucharist comes from the Greek word giving of thanks, which is mentioned at the 
Lord's Supper. Or communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. And we'll read about that in just a minute. And also the breaking of bread. This name suggests the simplicity of the occasion in daily life. And we see this term used explicitly in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, referring to the Lord's Supper. So let's read now 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Another key passage for this topic. You all with me? Show of hands. Good. Thank you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting from verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to as wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to, to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake at the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So this is a very rich passage that teaches us, as we consider the Lord's Supper, that it's a time of communion with the Lord, fellowship, our fellowship with the Father and the Son, and with each other. And we come together, we take the bread and the wine. As the Apostle points out, we cannot be in communion with idols and the Lord at the same time. So I, I don't know what the conversation was. Uh, if we read between the lines, maybe these, some of these Christians were saying, well, I mean, it's just an idol. I'm just eating, I'm just eating the, the, the meat that was left over. What's, what's wrong with that? I'm under grace. Can I do what I want? And so on and so forth. But what the Apostle Paul points out, it's something interesting for us too, is that behind everything, there is the spirit world. And while we're in the world, we're not to be of it. And we can be influenced by our associations with other people and, and certain activities and certain places. So we need to, we need to monitor our hearts. We, we can be tempted to worship the idols of our society. And perhaps unknowing, unknowingly be in a certain sort of communion with them. And of course, when we come to worship the Lord's Supper, at the Lord's Supper, um, we're not... We're not all, all there. So here, here's a first, first reason, a first way we can improve the Lord's Supper, and that is to check our hearts to see who we are in communion with. And during the week, who are we in communion with, really? If we're, with, if we're walking with the Lord and being in communion with him on every day of the week, well, it'll we'll, be easier for us to be with, in communion with him when we come to the Lord's Supper. The importance of worship. And uh, in Ezra chapter 3, for those of you who know your Bibles, when the people of Israel came back from uh, the captivity, what was the very first thing they did? They built an altar. They didn't build the temple. They didn't build up the walls. They built an altar. They worshipped. And if you think about, the, uh, think about the book of 1 Corinthians, that talks about a lot of church truth, Paul deals with a number of things, some disciplinary issues, and then he gets to chapter 10. It's what we just read about being in communion with the Lord. Chapter 11 is very specifically about the Lord's Supper. And then in chapter 12, it's about the gifts. Chapter 13 is about love. Chapter 14 is about order in the church. So what comes first? Communion, the Lord's Supper. In other words, the Lord's Supper in the early church was not just an add-on. It was in first place. It was a priority. In Acts 20, verse 7, we read of the breaking of bread. And we read this now. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. 
It's interesting. They didn't didn't say that in uh, on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to listen to Paul. <laughs> it says the first day of the week they came together to break bread. That was the very first thing on their mind was breaking bread. Oh yes, Paul's here. Well, we'll listen to him. And uh, in other words, it was a priority for them. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, we read, But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Father seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It was a priority. Worship is a priority for our God. He's looking for worship. So, <clears throat> is the Lord's Supper synonymous with worship? Can we only worship him at the Lord's Supper? Well, at the Lord's Supper, we're, we are simply and only focused on the Lord Jesus. It it's, suggests it's the height of worship. So there's a second way of making the Lord's Supper more interesting for us, to make it a, priori a priority for us in our lives. Worship. And remember that God wants to hear our worship. He wants to hear our praise. He wants our heart to be here. It's pleasing to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 we're going through a lot of things. You're being very attentive. Thank you very much. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to read from verse 17 to 34. Those, those of you who know me know that I'm going to finish on time, right? <laughs> so hang in there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34. We're not going to read them all, but starting at verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. And dropping down to verse 23, our key verses. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat and drink of the cup. So we have these instructions. Paul got these instructions from the Lord. And um, we have this little, uh, these four things. Look up. It was a commandment. It's not an option. This is why we refer to it as an ordinance. He says, look back, you proclaim his death. Look on till he comes, and then look in. Let a man examine himself. And he gives us an example here in 1 Corinthians 11. There was division among them. He said, you come together, but you're not really helping each other. So here's the third way we can make the Lord's Supper more interesting for us. And that is if we have resentment in our heart, if we're at odds with a brother or sister, we're to get these things right because the Lord has a hard time with that. So we cannot worship properly if, we're, if we have issues with each other. We have to make things right. We can't bring our gift to the altar if our brother's got something, uh, if we've offended our brother. So we're to, we're to make things right. So we're to, we're to remember three ways we can make the Lord's Supper more interesting. Be in communion with the Lord throughout the week. Make it a priority. And get right with our brothers and sisters. So, when do we do the Lord's Supper? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, it says, When you come together as a church. This was a church gathering. And we actually don't have any record of, of believers celebrating the Lord's Supper on their own. There's no mention of Paul celebrating the Lord's Supper during his long boat ride to Rome, for example. But we do have a lot of examples of, in Acts chapter 2, it says they continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says, Now on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. And um, 
The first day of the week, it's significant that our Lord appeared to his gathered disciples on his resurrection day, the first day of the week, and then also on the succeeding first day of the week. We take the Lord's Supper on the day that speaks of his rising power, the day that witnessed the triumph of his love. So there's the example that we have. Uh, who should participate? We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God, which is corn, to those who are sanctified in the Christ Jesus, called to be saints, and with all who are in every place, call on the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and, and ours. So this epistle is addressed to all believers, and it's addressed to us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, we read, For we, though many, are one bread, one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So what is the purpose of the Lord's Supper? Well, it's to remember him. It's to worship the Lord. And the Lord said, This do in remembrance of me, and taking the bread and the wine, we're meditating on who he was and what he's done, and what is it we're to share. Harry, Harry Ironsheart has put it this way, It's important, first of all, to understand that we do not come together to pray, nor yet to preach, nor sing, or listen to teaching, nor to enjoy Christian fellowship, we come together to meet the Lord himself, to be solely occupied with him, to offer him the worship of our hearts, and to remember what he passed through for us. So the time we set aside for the Lord's Supper, it's for the Lord. And it's sometimes hard for us, actually, to get our minds off ourselves and just to think on the Lord. So what is the format? And it's been pointed out that the Lord doesn't stipulate what the format is, that we're to, how we are to do this in remembrance of him. But we do have an example in the early church of their meetings. And in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26 to, 20 to 40, we have such key phrases as, Each of you has a psalm, you shall prophesy, the women keep silent, let all things be done decently and in order, and so on. And uh, so we follow that example. So how can we improve the meeting? I'm thinking of our own meeting. We saw three things. Be in communion with the Lord throughout the week. You know, the Lord's, the Lord's not interested in religion, by the way. We know that, right? He's not interested in uh, us sprucing up the outside of things. He's interested in our hearts. That's what's important to him. So we walk with the Lord, and we come together and share uh, our experience with the Lord. Make it a priority. We're all busy. We all have things to do. We all got important things to do. Is the Lord's Supper a priority for you? I'll put it to you. It's a priority for God. He wants to hear our praise. He wants us to remember him. And then, on the horizontal level, we need to be right with our brothers and sisters. We need to have a clear conscience. Sometimes the question is asked, is this the most important meeting? Personally, I think of our Sunday mornings as one big meeting in several parts. There's the Lord's Supper, it's a fellowship time, there's teaching time, and we have times of special intercessory prayer. And as such, we put into practice what we read in Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So, therefore, baptism. First we believe, then we receive the Holy Spirit. And we request water baptism by immersion. If you haven't been baptized, speak to one of the elders. And then there's the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. I bless the God and Heavenly Father. We're thankful for your holy and precious word. We're thankful for these ordinances that you've given us. We're thankful, we're thankful that the word of God is very clear. And we're thankful, Father, that we can obey it with your help. But you want us to, to do it. And you have your part and we have our part. So, Father, help us to uh, live according to how your word directs. Bless us and guide us. And we know that you're interested in our hearts above all things. So we commit our hearts to you for your grace and your work. Help us. We're all weak 
in many ways, but we have your Holy Spirit, and you are there to lead us and to guide us and to bless us, and you do. And we thank and praise you for that. Bless us now as we part. And may indeed, may we continue on this day. May we trust and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much.